the Dell Power Edge 2850. Episode 1 of this old server starts right now. Hello everyone and welcome to the inaugural edition of this old server. This series will highlight the technology that used to run the world of business. Today I'm presenting a Dell PowerEdge 2850 2U rack mount server. This was a hand-me-down from a former employer of mine and it had been sitting in my closet for some time now. The system was still running when it removed from production and I only powered it up when I brought it home to wipe the hard drives with Derek's boot and nuke, also known as D-Band. Prior to the hard drive erasure, it was running Windows Server 2003 R2 64-bit edition according to the DRAC web interface. So let's take a look around. The PowerEdge 2850 is a Generation 8 model from Dell, first released in 2005. This particular example was built April 27, 2006 according to the sticker on the side. For those of you not familiar with Dell's generational naming convention, from about 1996 onward, each new family of PowerEdge servers incorporated the generational identifier in its model number. For example, the PowerEdge 4100 is from the first generation, the PowerEdge 4200 is from the second, 4300 from the third, and so on. When they reached the tenth generation, Dell introduced the T-slash-R identifier in the model number, which is still used today, and that denotes whether the server is a tower model or a rack mount model. Okay, so back to our 2850 here. We can open up the case to take a look around inside. The top of the case on this model is secured with two thumb screws here on the front bezel. The case slides off a bit to the back with a little bit of pressure and then just comes right off. On the inside of the top cover, Dell conveniently provides a map of the system, at least in its base configuration, uh, for future reference if you make any changes to the system. This is pretty similar to what IBM did or does currently with uh, some of their machines. Under these heat sinks are two Intel Xeon processors from the Irwindale family, which is based on the consumer Pentium 4 series near the end of the NetBurst era microarchitecture. These are single core chips built on Intel's 90 nanometer process. Today's processors in comparison in early 2019 are flirting with sub 10 nanometer processes now. Irwindale also features hyperthreading technology meaning each chip has two threads whereby software instructions can be executed. Thus, with these two CPUs, the operating system has four logical processors at its disposal. These Xeons also come with Intel's 64-bit technology, with these Irwindale examples belonging to only the second server class line of Xeons to be so equipped. Unfortunately, this version of Xeon does not come equipped with Intel's VTX technology, which is for virtualization, so any modern hypervisor such as VMware or Hyper-V will simply not work. The Xeon line would not see VTX until the Dempsey series in mid-2006. Moving on to the RAM, which is under this black cover here. This system has 12 gigabytes of RAM installed. It's DDR2-400 Generation 8 of PowerEdge is the first to support DDR2 RAM, with the 6800 and 6850 models supporting the most at 64 gigabytes. I can't pull the shipping configuration from Dell's support website when entering this particular system's service tag, most likely due to the system's age and length of time since it was built. However, I would guess the server shipped with 8 gigs of RAM and was subsequently upgraded. It can hold a maximum of 16 gigs of RAM. Moving on to the rest of the internals, the Dell slash LSI PERC stands for Power Edge RAID, RAID Controller, 4E slash DI SCSI RAID Controller is installed, 
along with three PCI expansion slots on this single daughter card. The card is removable with this blue latch handle here. The rape controller battery, located here, saves data on the separate controller RAM here. This one happen to, happens to have 256 megabytes of cache RAM. In the event of a power loss, your data doesn't get corrupted before being written to the hard drives during a power loss event. Elsewhere on the motherboard, you have your standard features like a button cell battery, which will retain the CMOS slash BIOS settings while it's powered down, an ATI, also known as AMD these days, Radeon display adapter chipset, an Intel chipset, and other components that you would expect to see on any modern PC. You also have your power supplies. Now with the server, a lot of the components are designed in a modular fashion for ease of installation and uninstallation, such as the case with these power supplies. There are no exception. Moving to the back, the handles here are secured with thumb screws. You loosen the thumb screw and pull the supply out. If you were replacing this as a for instance, install the new supply, secure it in place, and tighten the thumb screw. Most servers come with two or more power supplies for redundancy. In case one fails, the machine can still run on the remaining good ones. Continuing on with the exterior and rear of this machine, your usual ports are present. The IEC 60320 power connectors on the power supplies, RJ45 ports for your two onboard NICs, and one for the DRAC network connection, your 9-pin serial, 15-pin VGA, PS2 ports for an older keyboard and mouse, and USB ports. This server also has a blue slash orange LED indicating simple OK or warning statuses. When all is well, this will be a steady blue. When there is an issue, it will blink orange until the problem is remedied. So let's move on to the front and look at the hard drives and everything else on the front cover. Alright, we've made it back to the front. We have the three hard drives here configured in a RAID 5 array. These are 146 gigabyte Ultra 320 SCSI drives. The drive with a one label looks to have been a replacement as it is a different brand than the other two. This is a Fujitsu versus the other two which are Maxters. This one also spins at 15,000 revolutions per minute versus the other two which spin at 10,000 RPM. These are hot swappable, so should one fail, it can be replaced with another without powering down the system, though you will notice a slight performance lag as the array rebuilds itself. This system supports up to six drives, though most ship with three, as that is the minimum required for basic RAID 5 redundancy. Also present is a three and a half inch floppy drive, a CD drive, your usual power button, and a small two-line status display. Like the blue-orange LED on the back, 
the color of this screen gives an at-a-glance indication of overall system status. When illuminated orange, an error code and brief error description scroll across the screen. When everything's OK, it's illuminated in blue, and by default, the system model number will scroll across the screen continuously. That is customizable in your BIOS settings. You can use it to show the host name or any other message you want to scroll across the screen. All right, now that we've taken a tour of our PowerOS 2850, let's button it back up, connect it to power, a monitor, keyboard and mouse, and let's watch it boot up. All right, we're plugged in. You can kind of see the model number scrolling on the bottom of the screen already. The D-Rack gets power along with the rest of the system. But even when the server is not powered on, the D-Rack is still operational. You can hit it with the web browser and uh, perform some basic system maintenance from there, even without the server itself being turned on. So let's go ahead, hit the big red button, or in this case, big black button with green blinky light. And here we go. This error is just saying that the power supply does not have redundancy. That seems to clear over time as the server stays powered up. also see the orange blinking light here indicating that warning condition only because power supply number two doesn't have anything plugged into it right now As I mentioned before, this server was running 2003R2 when it was in production. When I brought it home, I wiped the drives with DBAN and removed the RAID configuration from the controller. I have since created a new RAID 5 array with these three drives and installed Windows Server 2008R2 on the machine. Even though the system would probably run it just fine, I feel the processors are too old to acceptably run Server 2012 or newer. Also bear in mind that with the absence of Intel VTX technology, Hyper-V or any other hypervisor simply won't work on this machine. That limits the capabilities of this system as a lot of data center applications are virtualized these days. Many servers running many tasks own one physical piece of metal to save space, power, and other resources. That is the norm these days, but this old girl just can't do it. Best application in my opinion for this machine would be an on-premises Active Directory domain controller or a file server. This would also be a very capable router slash firewall if you were to install something like Untangle 
and with two NICs available right away to whichever operating system you want, it makes it ideal for that particular role. Alright guys, that's going to wrap it up for this inaugural episode of this old server. I hope you enjoyed it. I expect future episodes to follow this same general format. If you have an old server that uh, you're not using and want to uh, send it my way for me to showcase, I'll be more than happy to do it. And uh, please like and subscribe because I have a couple of more just waiting in the wings to uh, showcase on future videos. So thanks for watching.